Okay, good morning everyone. Um, my name is David Thatcher from BSI. I'm the head of uh, sector for ESG standards at BSI. Thank you for joining this breakout session on purpose, more specifically BSI's PAS 808, which publishes in July and has been developed to support a better understanding of the behaviours that a purpose-driven organisation should adopt and apply. Um, I'm joined on this breakout session by two guests who are very well informed on the topic and we'll hear from both of them for about 15 minutes each. First, Andy Brown from Anglian Water and then Gemma Pickett from JLL, both of whom were members of the PAS 808 steering group. After that, there'll be a three-way uh, discussion on the points raised, and then we'll open it up to you, uh, questions. So please do post your thoughts in the Q&A function. But in framing this session, and given that I know much of the audience are standards makers and stand, or standards users or both, and many of you may be young professionals uh, having just entered the workplace, I think it's worth stressing that a topic like purpose is a relatively new space for a standards body like BSI to play in. Um, for over 100 years, we've developed standards for products, typically technical specifications. In the past four decades, we've helped shape process standards that address more risk-based challenges, such as quality, environmental, management. But what about organizational culture and values that a, a business that uses those product standards and applies those process-based approaches to, say, product recall and waste management? How can we capture in a standard what a principles-driven organization should look like? That was the task set before PAS, the PAS 808 steering group. And that seems a good cue to hand over to two businesses who are facing this very challenge. And we can find out why it was that they considered that more guidance was needed. So, Andy, if you're ready to go and uh, share your slides or share your screen, then I will pass the baton on to you. Okay, David. Thanks. Brilliant. come off camera so all the attention's on you Andy okay so hopefully you can see my slides yeah uh, yep. not quite yet sorry I can see oh. you but not yet your slides but um, I'll let okay. you know when they've come through <laughs> wow. is that still not coming through mm, not yet no um, okay. I mean, this should be a, a standard sort of Zoom means of sharing screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you click, if you click share screen at the bottom, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'd, um, I thought I had done that. On the share, I share screen. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Ah, right. Great. That's it. I'll that come works. <laughs> Excellent. There's always got to be a little bit of a technical hiccup to start. Okay, thanks very much, David. Um, so yeah, hi everybody. I'm uh, Andy Brown. I'm the head of sustainability with Anglian Water Group. And uh, yeah, in, in the kind of short kind of 10, 15 minutes I've got, I was wanting just to give you, I guess, a little bit of um, an insight into how we have progressed as a company through the kind of spectrum of um, corporate social responsibility, sustainability, and into purpose. And at the end of that, why we feel like, you know, we need um, a standard to help us understand what that, that um, how that purpose is, is kind of embedded within the business and to demonstrate to the outside world that we are kind of delivering against that, that purpose. So I'll try and do that over the next few, um, few minutes. So just really as a kind of backdrop to it, that's, um, so, something that I've just kind of grabbed from our, our website, which shows a little bit of the horrible word journey that, that we've been on as an organization. So, you know, in terms of environmental and social issues within, within our company, you know, they have been kind of part of our makeup since we were you know, kind of privatized as a, as a company back in the, back in the early nineties. And then, you know, as the kind of slide shows there, we started our, first climate change assessment back in, in 1993. We developed our first biodiversity action plan and embedded that into the company in, in 99. And then there have been a kind of, there has been an evolution of that approach over the last couple of decades. The thing um, from our perspective <clears throat> within Anglium was, was a kind of a, a, a bit of a monumental change, a bit of a step change in 2010. Whereas a company, we started to really understand the big external kind of issues 
that were you know creating the challenge for us and and to be perfectly honest the kind of the question around whether we had a sustainable business model kind of going forward and, and those challenges are ones we'll be familiar with with the, the, the kind of climate crisis and the the associated uh, biodiversity and natural crisis alongside that but also the pressures from uh, kind of growing population for us as a water company so back in 2010 that really made us stop and think about how we operated the business how we thought about sustainability and, and really the kind of the beginnings of well, what was our what was our genuine purpose uh, as a company that ended up with us really um, bringing everything together and, and st we stopped thinking about and setting separate sustainability goals and strategies um, outside of our business plan so at that point we brought everything together and said well you know what we want to be doing is creating a sustainable business plan with sustainable business goals um, and, and that's that's really what we we did in 2010 with the launch of you know what we'd call love every drop and and you know David mentioned culture and that for us was as much a cultural thing it's not a, you know it's not a logo it's not a kind of brand change that was really us trying to understand and embed within the company what role we needed to play in the environment uh, and in society and our communities more generally if we were going to be able to deliver our you know our service. Um, over the long term and be a sustainable company um, in, in all elements of environment, so kind of society and, and financially as well. As I said, that, that kind of really happened in 2010. That evolved and grew and developed um, kind of over time. And what really happened in terms of the next big step for us was understanding that you know, this was something that really ought to be truly, truly at the core of, of what we do. This should be part of our, our, our makeup. Um, and after kind of long conversations with our board in 2019, we actually um, amended our constitution. We, we rewrote our articles of association, the document that defines us as a company that what, you know, what we're there to do. And we brought purpose into the into the center of that so alongside giving kind of just and fair returns to our investors we said we should deliver environmental and social prosperity to the region we serve that should be the purpose of our of our organization so that's what happened in in, in 2019 we made those um changes we, um, you know, kind of formally announced that to, to the outside world. And over the last couple of years, we've been really trying to now embed that so that that is not just, you know, it's not a vision statement that's been created and, you know, sits behind the reception desk in our head office, that it is something that is lived and uh, is lived and breathed within the, within the company, from the very top of the company, from the board, right the way down to everybody who's making decisions um, within the company. Um, you know, and, and it, it, it's, you know, it's not a small thing to do that. We're one of the, the first kind of utilities to do it. We're, um, you know, one of the, the biggest companies to have made that change um, in the UK. But, you know, we said it's absolutely the right thing to do to, to kind of mission lock that into the, the company and protect that approach and that outlook kind of into the future. And there, and, you know, in, in trying to articulate that to the outside world, there are a number of documents there we've written that you can find on our website. One is a is a social contract where we have kind of outlined those big challenges around climate change and, and population growth. We've outlined what we believe is our approach and our commitment to delivering a more sustainable future. But then the third part of that contract is really about okay, what do what do <clears throat> customers and and people living in the east of England what's their role in, in kind of delivering that sustainable future as, as well. And then the other two documents are one around a, a kind of plan for green recovery um, and the other, another one for community recovery, particularly kind of prompted by the, the issues we've been through in, in the pandemic. Um, but when we changed our purpose, one of the things that, um, that we said is, you know, as well as defining that in the, in the articles of association, um, it said that that our directors had to have, um, you know, due regard to these in, in the way they make decisions, and in particular in in the kind of longevity 
in terms of how they consider decision making but also that as a company we ought to hold ourselves um, up to a set of responsible business principles now you know when we made that kind of statement um, we didn't know what those responsible business principles would would look like um, and we did <clears throat> you know we looked at the outside world and we looked at a number of ones that were, were kind of already on the market if you like but nothing seemed to fit in the way we were trying to express what we were trying to do kind of through embedding this into our into our culture into our company and rather than sitting down and, and creating our own set of, of what we believe were responsible business principles we wanted to to kind of do that in a way that um you know could be external externally understood and trusted um, and in developing the social contract we actually put that to, to customers and other stakeholders and said you know of these kind of external tools that are out there on the market at the moment which ones do you recognize and which ones would uh, you trust but also alongside that we put up um, um, the kind of question of, of BSI as well and would BSI be the, the kind of organization that you would you would trust um, in this area as it happened the, the kind of recognition and the trust um, for BSI came out the most strongly with our with our customer base and that's what led us to start conversations with with BSI around okay could we collaboratively develop a set of responsible business principles which has evolved over the last couple of years into this um, PAS 808 on on um, sustainably or purpose-driven um, organizations. So, I mean, I think we'll, we'll get into the, well, not necessarily into the detail, but we'll, we'll cover the PAS in a bit more detail um, once we've had these presentations. But again, and this, this slide is not meant for anyone to read. This was just um, put up as an illustration. This is the, the holding ourselves to account section within our annual report, uh, annual integrated report, which again, is on your website if you want to have a, have a look at it. But, we see this as really a really important part of being able to demonstrate that that we're not just you know we're not a company that's just set a, a purpose statement up there and you know we're just paying lip service to it we want to demonstrate that we are trying to make decisions in line with with that um purpose statement um and we're willing to kind of you know uh, report that honestly and be judged against that so in in the uh, annual reports up to now, we've, we've um, been using uh, the business in the community responsible business tracker and we put the, the kind of details of that in there. But in future reports, what we uh, are planning to do uh, after the, the PAS is published is to assess ourselves against the PAS, which has got a set of principles and then a set of kind of example or exemplar behaviours in there. And, and we're looking to kind of um, assess ourselves against that and get that kind of that, that assessment verified and then publish that. Um, I think it's going to be too big, a, too big a, an account to put in the annual report account. So we'll have to publish that as a separate document, but put that out there in the public domain as a separate document on our website um, to be to be scrutinized and to be challenged and to let other people come back at us and say, well, OK, you know, according to the behaviors, you know, this is what you're saying, but actually we challenge you on x y and z so for us it's it, you know we really want to think about this PAS as a way of demonstrating and, and differentiating um ourselves as an organization that has gone that extra step and embedded purpose into our being and developed processes in our decision making to track you know whether or not we are making decisions in line with that purpose whether we have created a culture that enables all of our employees and all of our stakeholders to kind of feed into the delivery of that purpose whether that is kind of driven through our supply chain or our value chain, kind of up in up into a, you know, our, our, our supply chain and down into our customers, and that's you know that is what we're we're hoping that the PAS will do for us. So I think David, I'll I'll, I'll stop there and I'll hand over to Gemma, and um, then we can perhaps pick up some of those points in the discussion afterwards and I'll yeah no, thank you Andrew um it could well be that Gemma's already got um the slides queued up and ready to go but just to give her a little bit of a minute or so just in case there's a, a similar glitch as we had beforehand um yeah all I say that's really really useful Andy I mean, I, what I thought was very interesting when you talked about that timeline it didn't strike me as being and we'll pick up on this in the kind of the discussion later on it didn't strike me as being there was a kind of big bang moment within Anglia where you said well we had a new CEO who came in in 2010 
and that just created this huge kind of ripple effect. It, it very much seems a very organic journey from both a bit of top down and a bit of bottom up, which I think is maybe something that a lot of organizations are experiencing. Some others have that sort of more seismic sort of uh, impact. The other thing I'd say, which I thought you mentioned quite a lot about Love Every Drop. I was at an event where one of your senior team was there and that, that, phrase, that particular phrase struck me as, as almost a case of not a business saying, please don't buy our product. It wasn't that or use our service, but it was very much that sort of curating stewardship. You know, our product, our service is really a valuable resource. Please, please look after it, which is almost like saying don't use too much of our product, which is a quite an extraordinary thing you, you'd hear from someone in, in a senior business. But I think it spoke in those three simple words to very much what what that kind of mission and purpose is, which is you know you're a you're a utility company, but water is a hugely precious resource. And and what your senior team was saying there was this needs to be something that is is kind of uh, treated as, as, as something that's uh, that's of, of great value and therefore not not wasted. Um, great, Emma. Um, sorry, Gemma. Rather, sorry. Um, uh, um, I think you have some slides. So, are, are they ready to go? Yep. Great. I'll come off camera and I'll come off mic, uh, and then we'll. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you on the other side of this. That's great. Thanks. Super. Um, you're going to need to let me know when you can see them, if you can. Uh, yep. That went. That went very seamlessly. Brilliant. We can see yeah, them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So yeah, hi everyone. Um, thanks, David and Andy. I'm Gemma. I'm the head of corporate sustainability at JLL. Um, if anyone doesn't know who JLL is, essentially we are a large global uh, real estate advisory firm. So we work with a range of developer, occupier and investor clients on real estate with a really, really strong focus for us on leveraging technology towards real estate portfolios, but also a very, very strong focus on sustainability. And that's absolutely a kind of a core priority for our business at the moment. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the approach that we've taken to purpose, um, but we're, we're probably in quite a different place to where Andy and Anglian Water are in that we're, we're probably slightly earlier on in our journey. Um, but I'll talk a bit about the approach that we've taken and then also, and David, I hope this is OK. I've tried to maybe start to tease out some of the things that we could be discussing and thinking about as we approach this this area of purpose. So JLL's purpose is to shape the future of real estate for a better world. Our purpose was launched globally in 2019. And what happened with that with that launch was a program of kind of engagement with some of our senior leaders to help them understand and set the tone of purpose. And then also a range of kind of internal, external and employee engagement campaigns. What I would say, and maybe this is something that we can come on to in, in the, the discussion, is that for us as a firm, our history with sustainability is incredibly long and incredibly strong. So we acquired um, a sustainability consultancy more than 20 years ago now in the UK. So really trying to put sustainability at the forefront of real estate and property um, and the property sector. And so I think we, we've got a really long history of that. And what we're trying to, to kind of understand now and to, to make our progress on is how all of these things align and come together towards a purpose driven approach. So that we have the global purpose and then in the UK, which is the area that obviously I'm responsible for, the approach that we've taken in the UK, kind of reflecting, I guess, where we are in terms of our evolution is that on the right hand side, what you can see is our most recent sustainability strategy. This was launched in the middle of last year and what we decided to do was to kind of make clear our intent to be more purposeful around purpose. So really to put some, uh, I guess, commitments in the public domain around, actually we're going to really look at this properly and really make sure that we are developing what we truly believe is a purpose-driven approach. So part of that obviously is supporting the development of the PAS and we'll, we'll come on to talk about um, the details of that and some of the, the role that that will play in purpose in the UK more broadly. And I should say really uh, just kind of thankful for Andy on his leadership on this and for inviting us to be part of it because it's really been a very very helpful process for us. I'd also say that we've collaborated an awful lot with other organizations some through the the process of developing the PAS so organizations like Regenerate and Blueprint for a Better Business who are doing 
kind of lots of work in the purpose area. And I think we're quite clear, and I'm, I imagine, Andy, you probably feel the same, that actually this isn't, you're not going to necessarily get to an end point with purpose. It's going to be a kind of ongoing uh, education and journey as to how you remain purpose driven. So certainly for us, collaborating with those types of organisations has been really helpful to help us learn and also develop and refine our approach. So why do we need a purpose driven approach? I, um, I thought I would give a few thoughts as to, I guess, kind of my perspective on what, why this is important and why, why we need a standard around this stuff. Um, can I just check that you can still see what I'm sharing? I think I've got a bit of a glitch. Uh, it just kind of briefly went, yeah, it, it went to that Colin Mayer quote and then went back to the first one just a, a few seconds ago, but it's on the, okay. it's on the Colin Mayer slide as it were. Why do we need um, a purpose driven approach? I'm not sure what's just happened there. Bear with me and I'm just going to try again. Um, is it back? Okay. Uh, it's back, yeah, yeah. And we're now okay. back full, full screen on the Colin Mayer quote, yeah. Oh, great, super. Sorry, apologies. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, but yeah, I thought it might be helpful in terms of us having a discussion and just to, to offer a couple of, I guess, a couple of thoughts on why we need a purpose-driven approach, why is it important? One of the things that I talk to a lot about colleagues is kind of what does it mean? I know that sounds really basic, but what does what does it mean? Um, and obviously some of the work that the standard is trying to do is to help us unpack some of those difficult terms and, and help people gain understanding. So a couple of helpful definitions. Obviously, the second one there is directly from the PAS. Um, and we'll talk more about that. But I think calling out the long term well-being and, and specifically the kind of strategic contribution that a firm or an organisation can make is a really helpful way of thinking about it. And then the quote from Colin Mayer, who's often referred to as a kind of leading expert when it comes to purpose. Um, I suppose his perspective deals quite helpfully with that relationship between kind of profit and purpose, which again is something that, that can come up quite a lot in these types of conversations. So a couple of thoughts there on some helpful go-to definitions. In terms of um, reasons why organizations would be adopting a purpose-driven approach and, and some of the benefits that that uh, that can bring. So I guess this is as true for us as it probably is for other organizations and there will be more and different reasons why organizations want to become purpose-driven. For us, it's um, one of the things is that it, it absolutely offers us an opportunity to really galvanize our employees and our people around this unifying objective. So we know, having had discussions with employees and, and doing various kind of activities and consultations, that actually these types of issues and being becoming more purpose driven and focusing on the wider role of the business in society and in relation to the environment is something that's really important to them. And what we want to be able to do is to bring all of that together and provide that kind of space for the conversations to be happening in the firm. So for us, it absolutely galvanizes that. The, the really good example that is used, it's often used um, on this point is around uh, NASA and the, the caretaker responding to the question of, you know, what's your job? And their response is, We're in the, I'm in the, the business of putting somebody on the moon. So really kind of unifying everybody around that objective can really bring some significant benefits, I think, in relation to colleagues. For us, it can also support client relationships, right? So a lot of our clients are also really interested in this area and are them themselves thinking about how they can be more purpose driven. Some of the conversations that we have when uh, in the business, when we're thinking about adopting a more purpose driven approach. So coming to some of the things that uh, are included in some of those definitions is actually it, it will, will set us up better to be able to respond to clients ongoing needs and evolving needs. And that innovation point comes through really strongly there. So if we think thinking about a problem or a task or trying to tackle something and we're adding in different perspectives on this particularly for us with a focus on uh, the regions in the UK so we do a lot of work on regeneration and ensuring that our regions are thriving these are really helpful ways to frame some of those areas and to, to kind of augment the work that we do there and the last one here which um, could easily have been the first one you know, companies absolutely and organizations absolutely need to be focusing on the role that they can play in relation to tackling some of the significant issues that the world is facing when it comes to climate and social inequality. We often talk about this decade as being the decade of action. Someone rightly said to me the other day, we're already two years in. 
So we really, really need to be uh, reorientating ourselves towards becoming purpose driven in order to be able to respond to the significant challenges of the current of the current world. So the role of has, um, I think this is probably my last slide, it is. So yeah, I thought I'd offer some, some thoughts on maybe the role of the PAS and how some of that work that's happened with that will help the purpose, um, I guess the purpose landscape. And then also some, some things for us to be aware of. So some of the potential challenges, not just not necessarily in relation to the standard itself, but in relation to looking at purpose and thinking about becoming more purpose driven. So I think one of the key things for me in terms of the value of, of um, PAS 808 is that the, the experts that have been brought together to work on this fairly challenging and fairly still new area has been really fantastic. Um, and I think that's a real strength behind the group. So I certainly wouldn't include myself in that, but some of the experts that we've had on that group um, have really been leading in their field. And I think they've brought an awful lot to to this debate and i'm sure and i think the what we'll see in terms of the outcome from the standard will definitely be evident there so it absolutely provides structure on how to approach purpose-driven perspective so as andy was saying there are lots this is an still an emerging area and there's lots of kind of ways to think about things um, but what this standard does really helps to in a kind of fairly concise way it's a it's a easy way to start to think about how you would approach being purpose-driven and it helps, the third point there, it helps to kind of educate on some of those difficult and complex areas and sometimes the overlapping concepts. So it's a really helpful kind of go to whether you're starting out or whether you're in the, the middle of your journey. I guess what I would say, and this isn't in no way negative, but it's just kind of realistic, is that it's not, um, it, it shouldn't be used standalone. I'm very strongly of the view that actually, given that this is such a challenging area, there's lots to think about. For me, the standard is kind of one of those inputs in what will probably require a number of inputs for an organization or a business to get this right. So certainly it's absolutely something that we'll draw on and we will use in our business, but we'll use that alongside some of the other tools and, and the other frameworks that are also out there. In terms of potential challenges, I hope I'm okay for time, David. I won't be too much longer. Um, number one, there, I've put it's all too complicated. So I think some of the conversations that we had at the steering group were very much around how do we kind of retain the, the academic uh, kind of integrity of this work, but also make sure that it is um, user friendly enough and that there's actually going to have some kind of utility in the, in the quote unquote real world. So I think there is definitely a job of work to be done, hopefully with this community that's going to grow around this standard so to be an active part of some of that kind of demystifying and helping people understand it. And there's been a number of discussions at the steering group about, you know, what different audiences need and which, which types of organizations need different guidance. So I think that's absolutely something that we just really need to keep a kind of check on, I guess. Um, I think more broadly, competing priorities in businesses. So uh, I think what you see, tend to see a lot of is, you know, people have got an awful lot to do. Um, and this can sometimes feel like another layer of stuff on top. I think, again, um, helping people get to grips with kind of the, the way in which purpose and a purpose driven approach can lead to that greater employee engagement, can, can add to the client value proposition, can help with that innovation is a way to, to try and kind of broach some of those conversations. And then the third point there briefly is, is something that we've been kind of tussling with a, a little bit is just how we understand purpose alongside sustainability. Are they the same thing? Does it matter that there's that term and the other term and, and trying to kind of help people through, through some of that. And then the last thing there is around maintaining authenticity. I'd say this is absolutely the most important point to this. I think Andy said this a number of times about, you know, this not just being a slogan and making clear that there are, that there's real kind of teeth behind this and it's truly embedded in the business. Um, this is something that we should be looking to all organizations to do if they're, if they're saying they're driven. It's something that all organizations will be on a journey with, but it's really important. I think that this doesn't get stuck in the kind of, PR marketing bucket solely and that it's actually something that businesses can can kind of hold their hands up to and say this is really the way in which we're living and breathing our purpose and this is how we're going to be kind of um, I guess sharing with stakeholders the way in which we're doing that and, and kind of like Andy we have 
a similar type of approach to reporting around trying to explain how we're making some of these decisions and the different inputs that we've considered as we do so. So I hope that was helpful, just some, some thoughts on um, some of the ways in which we have been approaching purpose and the role potentially that the PAS could play in that. That's, that's really helpful, Gemma, thank you. And I think you're right at the end there to talk about the, you know, the challenges, because I think one thing I wanted to pick up um, when I sort of, in a way, come to the three-way chat, um, probably my first question actually, is the fact that picking up on something Andy said about their journey and the fact that I think it was in 2019 when they looked at what was already out there, but to your point also, which is this is a complex space. There are, there are other sort of ESG benchmarking services out there. So therefore, it's not as if uh, PAS 808 is putting itself um, uh, at the front of the queue, as it were, as being the only solution. I think you, at the end there, you were saying that different organizations at different points in the journey will be reaching for different solutions. So just to talk, address that one with the three of the three, two of you, um, Andy, you talked about looking at other existing frameworks and maybe they didn't quite fit where Anglia was. Um, some people will be familiar with, say, um, B Corp, um, and th th that um, that's often actually increasingly on product labels as well. You know, we are a B Corp, proud member of B Corp. Can can Andy, from your own experience, but also Gemma, just explain what maybe B Corp is and maybe how PAS 808, as I see it, certainly isn't setting itself in competition with that, and in fact, actually, uh, B Lab were represented on the steering group as the both of you were. So it's part of a more collaborative process, recognizing where different solutions can be more complementary rather than kind of uh, clashing. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll try and kind of give a, a succinct response and then Tam can jump in as well. So, I mean, certainly, yeah, for, for us, we looked at a number of different tools um, and, and, you know, as Gemma rightly said, you know, we will continue to seek input from all sorts of different places. I guess, you know, what I just wrote down in thinking about that was that there's a difference between um, a kind of performance benchmarking tool and I would say you know B Corp and, and getting B Corp status is is um, more along the kind of benchmarking your your performance and your outputs what I think has is is it's it's a framework to really stress test your whole approach to purpose and whether you have embedded it within your kind of corporate DNA within your decision making within the way you do business so that that's how i would define and you know we we have done other benchmarks i was <laughs> coming straight off um a an esg benchmarking activity um just before this um before joining you so yeah we are still doing those things but i, I see them as complementary rather than kind of competitive okay so it, it's possibly and jump in if i'm getting this wrong it's it's more presenting a, a, an end destination and recognizing there are inevitably going to be different you know, roads to go towards that, that end point. And therefore different businesses may choose different vehicles on different roads. But as long as we can maybe all agree what that end destination looks like, then that's hopefully something that, that PAS 808 uh, has achieved in that sense. Um, and Gemma, any, any view again on, on, it can be a crowded space. This is back to your point about it's complicated and it can therefore mean some organizations may even say, do you know what, let's not even go there because it's just, it's just like a jungle of different um, reporting frameworks and the like. Is that something that JLL have experienced, um, you know, and, and you know, got some sort of, you know, scars to sort of prove that you've, uh, you've been in the wars there? I mean, I guess the, the, the point that we've got to, which I think is probably similar to Andy's, is that um, I, I, I wouldn't want to... This is difficult stuff in the sense that it's meaningful stuff, right? So, you know, these are really important concepts for organizations to think about. I wouldn't want anyone to feel completely kind of overawed by it, but but I think the the different the different tools that are available are going to work at different times for different organizations given the stage that they're at. So I think for me, what the standard does is poses some kind of really fundamental, helpful questions about. The way in which an organization should be so that, that kind of the way of being is where it gets you to which i i think is probably different you know not necessarily to the b corp but some of the other benchmarks and standards that are out there um it, it's a very kind of fundamental you know how should you operate as a business if you want to be purpose driven but that's not to say that you know those other tools and, and frameworks 
uh, are unhelpful. They're absolutely not. It's just about what's kind of what's right for the business or the organisation at that time. Okay. And, and one question I was going to perhaps put to you, Gemma, first of all, because you mentioned on your opening slide that you're a global business uh, and also you're part of the UK team. Um, and Andy, I'm guessing, unless I, I don't understand the kind of organisational structure of Anglin, that you're not a global business. Ha given a lot of this comes down to things like culture and, and um, you know, organisational values, is, is, is the, leaving aside PAS 808 for, for a minute, but is, is the concept of purpose something that is readily applicable in, in different parts of a global business? Or is that in itself another challenge that you have to kind of get around? Yeah, so it's, it's absolutely a challenge for us. So we have nine on 100,000 people globally. So, um, you know, getting everybody focused towards that, that guiding North Star is, as you can imagine, is, is challenging. Um, but that's part of the process, right? So part of the process is understanding the impact and the role that we can have as a business, but then also enabling people to, to do that bottom up as well. So to think about purpose in relation to their role and the unique role that they can play. So it's definitely something that as a global firm we need to be thinking about and, and grappling with um, but that's also where some of that creativity and some of the the, the positive aspects of being purpose-driven that I spoke about comes through. Okay okay so again I think Andy you mentioned about um, pilot sorry go on do you want to respond to what Gemma said yeah no no, no I was just going to jump in and say you're right in that you know we're not a global business we're predominantly kind of focused in in, in the UK but our supply chains are global and yeah. so purpose doesn't end with you know just your company you know you've got to be thinking and we've all got to be thinking about what what some of the global issues are um and, and you know purpose can be a fantastic way of, of you know ensuring that we do do that so actually that's probably going to be my next question um the the, the role that you think something like uh, well the role the role that i suppose purpose as i kind of as a as a manifesto almost but also the role that maybe something like has 808, whereby it's kind of codified in, in, in a single document. Do you see, both of you, do you see that as being something that will hopefully drive change across the supply chain? And I presume since you're both large organizations and that small organizations might be, you know, given what everyone's experienced in the last sort of two years or so, might say, you know what, we're just trying to keep the, wheel, the wheels on here, the lights flashing, and now you're giving us this whole kind of purpose thing. You know, to what extent can a large organization both in a way, uh, ask its supply chain to work to um, something like PAS 808 in terms of that uh, 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 can drive change through procurement, but also support them in that in their own journey as well. In the same way that you've, you've both been quite open about the fact that you know your journey started at different points and it's it's maturing in different areas. It's, it's got to be somehow a, a very collaborative process, presumably. Yeah, and I think uh, I don't know if you can see the the chat. David, but we've also had a question, I think, from Andrea, ah. which I guess links to that a bit about the um, the kind of expectation and the and how realistic this is for for SMEs, I guess, as well. So I think so. So my perspective on that would be that um, certainly, I think, as large firms, and Andy talked a bit about value chain. I think there is there's definitely a role for large firms to be, you know, not just laying out their expectations around some of this stuff, but actually being a helpful part of the ecosystem that supports everybody to, to further these types of approaches. So certainly for us, we've done a lot of work with our supply chain on different aspects of the kind of sustainability world. So a lot of the, the education and the support uh, to, on, on those areas. And I would see this evolving in a similar way. So rather than it being a kind of top down, these are our expectations, it's much more of a kind of two-way two street and a, and a role for the large firms to to be helping with that leadership and that education bit I mean I think in terms of um if maybe we could just respond to Andrea briefly and then I'll pass over to Andy I think um so, so certainly my comment wasn't to to scare people off but rather just to I guess be realistic about some of the challenges that might come with with some of these approaches some of the discussion that we've had within the steering group and David maybe this is something you can comment on is is actually what what do we need to do to put alongside this standard that speaks specifically to SMEs to be able to support some of those conversations? I think my my sense is that actually a lot of these thoughts and considerations in in all businesses are kind of already happening, 
and what the, what the standard does is give you a way to approach them in a bit more of a systematic way so certainly it's the case for us that kind of purpose related conversations will be happening throughout the business and what something like the standard does is allows us to bring some framework and structure and support to those conversations um but yeah D david and andy i don't know if you want to add to to those comments uh, i was only only to say yeah i absolutely agree i think you know it's um lots of these conversations are you know are, are live in our supply chains kind of already but do they are they done in that kind of drawn together you know um approach or are we having separate conversations on well-being through the supply chain modern slavery through the supply chain environmental carbon whatever you know actually i think this framework helps to set out you know this is the type of company that you know we should all be aspiring to deliver and i think there's also the opportunity element which we don't always talk about you know as, as big companies are setting new targets new approaches to delivering in a more purposeful way that enables new disruptive kind of smes in the supply chain to come and deliver or support the delivery of those from a, from a large organization's perspective yeah, I come on to the disruptive bit and I, I maybe just a, perhaps a closing point about perhaps um, innovation. But Andrew, thank you for your question. I, I didn't spot it in the chat, actually. I was looking at the Q&A, but that's great and, and a really good point. Um, and I think this is a unique event in a way because it's, it's one in which most attendees are standards, makers and users. Uh, and therefore, most of you know that the shape of the solution that BSI publishes is, is, is totally determined by the experts that we convene to say what's needed here is guidance as opposed to what's needed here is a requirement-based standard. And, it, and it's, it's evident to me that this topic, our conversation, but what I knew about it before, is the kind of topic that clearly cannot have a, uh, a pass-fail um, type of output because that would then in a way exclude many organizations who are not, not as mature in, in recognizing or being able to kind of um, put purpose into their business as you both explained. So because it's a principles based standard, it's, as you say, it's much more of a collaborative tool and the in general where you can talk to your suppliers. And in a way, I mean, this is a conversation I'm familiar with from, you know, things to do with, um, you know, carbon greenhouse gas management. You know, often a supplier isn't quite where you want them to be, but you don't want to just cut them off and say, well, sorry, we're, we've got a hard stop here. You know, at the end of this year, we have to demand this of all of our suppliers. You want to support them. And it's, it's clear that some will be able to move further and faster than others, but that doesn't mean you therefore end that, that terminate that conversation. It's about collaboration. And I think what Gemma was saying, and you're saying, Andy, this type of solution, PAS 808, is something that you can use as, a, as, the, as to begin a conversation with suppliers and then say, well, this is where we're heading and let's see what we can do to bring you, you know, moving in the same direction. I, I think one thing I want to talk a little bit about, I know we've only got a few minutes left, and I think unless I'm missing it, there are no other questions, but you mentioned about maybe um, su suppliers who are being more, well, you said disruptive, that, that can be a positive as well as a negative, but I mean, is there a role here for innovation and in supporting organisations to be more purpose driven and uh, any examples you can think of in, in the different sectors you work in? Oh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. If you think about the, the some of the environmental elements of, of what we do and the, the, the kind of the end destination, the environmental destination we're trying to get to kind of net zero and, and biodiversity positive, um, we cannot, absolutely cannot do that without input from an innovation from our supply chain. You know, we have um, drastically reduced the carbon that goes into the things that we build. People tend to think of the water industry as a service industry, but we are a big constructor, you know, and the carbon going into the assets that we create today is 63% less than it was, you know, 10 years ago. And that's through the, the kind of dedication and the innovation in our supply chain. And, um, you know, we see that in, in other elements of, uh, of our work as well. Joe, any, any thoughts on innovation as we kind of close? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. I think um, it can absolutely be a key part of it for us. Uh, you know, some of the examples, we've got loads of examples in our client service, but also on our own estate, I guess, as Andy was saying, we've worked with a number of 
supply partners to um, do some of our new offices. And that means that our desks are made out of yogurt pots. That's also created social value in various other ways. So I think all of these types of conversations, bringing different people together can help result in, in some really interesting solutions like that. Great, I think we are out of time. Thank you both for your, your insights. It's been really helpful. And thank you for the question, Andrew, as well. I'll probably close by saying that PAS 808 will be publishing in July. Uh, it will be a free download. But one thing I was actually going to turn into a question, but I think I haven't got really time for now is that the journey in a way from, from BSI's perspective doesn't end in July with the publication of 808. It's a free download. Um, it's, it's about building a community of practice in a way around uh, PAS 808. And I think that's something that hopefully Angling Water and JL will be part of going forwards. But um, what I think we want to do is actually, it's almost to Andrea's question, is, is make sure there is a meeting place online where people who have actually picked up 808 and started to apply it can share their experiences, which is very much your one of your closing points, um, Gemma, about the idea that you know the journey continues and therefore it's not going to be fixed you know, overnight, clearly. But that's something I really am I'm passionate about, making sure that we're in the centre of here, having been the, the vena of, of the expertise, uh, yourself and, and Andy and others, is that we become also the, the home of where um, you know, best practice and the application of 808 uh, can can be sort of focused on going forwards and, and future versions of 808 can be built on the, the real application experience of those organizations, be they large or small, um, in, in using it. So I think that you know, the journey is only just beginning in terms of 808, which then picks up on your own journey sort of metaphor as well. But I think the journey as far as this uh, breakout has, uh, is concerned has come to an end. Thank you, Gemma, again for your, your insights and time. And thank you, Andy, and all the questions. And uh, thanks to the BSI team for, for hosting us on this as well. That's great. Thank you very much and have a good rest of conference. Bye for now. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye. Cheers. Bye.